Okay, thanks, Julie. So whenever I start talking to people about nutrition, okay. first thing I would say is that nutrition is as much about what you drink as what you eat. Because no matter how good your food choices are, that can actually be offset if you have too much in the way of excess alcohol, too much in the way of caffeinated drinks, whether that's your sixth, seventh, eighth cup of coffee, or whether that's your Coca-Cola, and the lovely artificial sweeteners you find in your soft drinks, or simply just not getting enough water. So nutrition is always about your food and drink combined. Now, who cares about our food and drink intake? Well, that would be Public Health England. Okay, so this was the latest survey published, which shows that in the last nine years, we haven't been doing very well in terms of our nutrient intakes. But that's not really surprising, because take something so simple as fruit and veg, okay? We know that you're supposed to have roughly five portions of fruit and veg. So if I say, I have five apples, is that enough? Well, no, because Public Health England says you need a combination of fruit and veg, and if you look at the fine print, it's supposed to be at least two portions of fruit and three portions of vegetables, so a bit more vegetables than fruit. And the more portions you have, the better. So six is better than five, seven is better than six. Well, if you look at that, what is a portion? So we know five apples won't cut that for Public Health England. So how about one apple, a tangerine, and maybe just a few tablespoonfuls of maybe your peas, sweet corn, and carrots. But Public Health England says no, so it's one apple's portion, two tangerines is another portion, and three heat tablespoonfuls of your peas, sweet corn, and carrots makes another portion. And that's just to get you to three. So you can see why the public really isn't adhering to Public Health England's guidelines. Take something else like oily fish. For a start, who knows what oily fish is? You may be able to name one or possibly two. Oily fish would be something like salmon, sardines, trout, mackerel, kippers, okay? And your, as opposed to your white fish, such as your cod, plaice, and pollock. Now, we know what oily fish is now, but actually, how much should you have? So Public Health England says that you should have at least two portions of fish a week, of which one should be oily. So I can have lots of oily fish, can I? No. Public Health England says you should have no more than four portions of oily fish if you're a man, and no more than two portions if you're a woman of childbearing age, because you risk getting mercury poisoning. So we now know that a portion of oily fish is supposed to be two portions at least um, a week, for two portions of fish, no more than four for men or two for women. Okay, but what is a portion? That's about a can of salmon. So essentially, you can see how complex it is to sort of try and understand nutrition. But what I say is that, for example, just having a chocolate bar today won't make a big difference. And we're allowed to do that. That's fine. It's all about balance. But with a chocolate bar every day, it's the cumulative effect. That's the problem. So we can compare our bodies to a car. So, a car's fuel is their petrol, our fuel is our food and drink. Now the car, its exhaust fumes are basically its waste products. Now for us, all our cellular actions, at the moment we're undergoing lots of cellular actions, all those, they produce something called free radicals. So if I explain that a bit, so every cellular reaction Okay. You've got oxygen, which is a molecule, which is broken down into its singular atoms. And each oxygen molecule has a pair of electrons. And when that breaks down that oxygen molecule into um, its individual atoms, you get a free electron. And the problem with the free electron is that this is a free radical, which is highly, highly toxic to your cells. It is scavenging another free radical to make it balanced. So what happens is all the cellular actions that's happening in your body, you produce this free radical, and the only way, one of the only ways that you can combat that is that you've got some antioxidant defenses in your body, but that's not enough. You need antioxidants. So that's what's happening all the time, all the cellular actions, which are reducing the waste products, which is the free radicals, and the only way to counteract that, in addition to our own system, because we don't have enough of that, is antioxidants and we get antioxidants from our uh, fruit and veg, as well as other things like nuts and seeds. So when the free radicals are attacking cells, 
it's damaging cells, of course. So it's breaking down their outside fatty uh, membrane and their protein membrane. And by doing that, it sets off inflammation. And that underlies all the chronic diseases, such as heart disease, strokes, type 2 diabetes, asthma, and so on and so forth. So really, I see nutrition as this preventive type of medicine. And the problem is a lot of people, it's not until they get their little heart attack, which is a warning sign of maybe a fatal heart attack later, or angina, which is some problem where you've got chest pain, saying later on you might get a heart attack, or you have a mini stroke. These are the wake up signs that people then say, okay, I should pay attention to my lifestyle. I should pay attention to my nutrition, my sleep, my stress levels and exercise. But I think it would be good if we could actually be a bit more preventative than rather reactive when we get that wake up call because a lot of the population isn't like that. So when I was doing um, an acute medicine in my early stages of my career, I would see a lot of people come in with all these chronic health conditions and the elderly people especially, for example, you have a heart attack. When you're 50 and you have a heart attack, you might be able to survive that. But when you're 70 and a heart attack, that's a totally different story, okay? And when, when you see the aged population having all these degenerative diseases, it makes you stop and think, actually, could I have done something earlier? And that's when I realized that nutrition is very powerful in helping prevent these diseases. And when I went into histopathology as well, what I found as well there, when we're doing the autopsies, 80 to 90% of people were dying of heart attacks and strokes. So when we're doing autopsies with people who suddenly dropped down dead and we didn't know. And even people who weren't dying with heart attacks or strokes, that wasn't the number one cause written on their death certificate, you could see that they would have a heart attack probably in the next few years because you could see their coronary arteries stuffed full of this fatty calcified deposit. I mean, in TV, you see the hearts maybe in operation theatres and you see the heart beating with the little tiny coronary arteries. But when you're in the autopsy suite and you see this cold heart being suffocated with fat encasing it and inside or outside you've got these tiny blood vessels which are literally a couple of millimetres width in diameter, really stuffed with calcified fatty plaques, you really think we should try and be more preventive in our life before we end up like that with a sudden death. Now, we know that a lot of chronic health diseases, especially like cardiovascular disease, are associated with depression, type two diabetes, obesity, and so on. And that's not surprising, but the reverse is also true. So depression increases your risk for cardiovascular disease. And the reason why this all links up is because we know that inflammation as well contributes to depression. So that's the connecting factor with all these chronic health conditions and depression as well. So, if this is a factor, inflammation, and we know that inflammation causes physical health conditions, the question is, with the inflammation possibly causing depression, if we have a look at our diet, could that help mental health? And the answer is, it looks very, very promising. So this field, nutritional psychiatry, has been exploding in the last few years, and it's by an Australian group, and they've looked at the first question as, if I improve my diet, does my mental health improve? Okay. So first of all, when we look at scientific studies, you come up with a hypothesis, so it'd be observational. So I might say, okay, so dark-haired women and men, they like black rapes. Is that true? So that's an observational study. It makes me come up with my hypothesis. But then I've got to test it by something called our randomized controlled trials. And this is like the gold standard in science. And then I find actually, you know what? Men and women with dark hair and fair hair like grapes, black grapes. So that's what we have to do. We have to do our randomized controlled trial. And this Australian group, it was in 2017, so only two years ago, they did this first randomized controlled trial, looking at people, if they had a Mediterranean diet, would that help their depression? So I really like the acronym of this trial, so SMILES, supporting the modification of lifestyle in low emotional states. So what they too did, they took a bunch of about 60 people, they all had depression, clinical depression, some were receiving medication, some were receiving therapy, I was receiving a bit of both, split them into two groups, and in the first group, they gave them seven sessions with a clinical dietitian, advised them how to follow a Mediterranean style diet. And the second group, they similarly gave seven sessions, but it's just social support. So it's a bit of talking therapy, which is supportive. And they followed these groups for 12 weeks. Now, what they found 
was this first group where they had the Mediterranean diet advice and they were following, they found that 32.3% of people actually went from having depression, clinical depression, to being remission. So they didn't have depression then. And I remember that 32.3% because this is just really astonishing. And it's only done two years ago. So this is really an interesting um, part of psychiatry. So a third of people, they went from being clinically depressed just by changing their diet over 12 weeks to a Mediterranean diet, they went to not being diagnosed as depressed, they went to remission. Whereas the control group, so we said social support does help, they, um, about 8% of those people who were depressed, they, um, they actually went into clinical remission. So that's really staggering figures. A third of people in a good diet, healthy diet, and 8% um, just following normal diet. Now, this Mediterranean diet, we all know what this looks like, I think. So basically, your fruit and veg, lots of whole grain food. So that could be your wholemeal bread, your, um, your brown pasta, things like that, your legumes, so there'd be your beans, chickpeas, lentils, there would be your nuts and a good helping of olive oil, when I mean a good helping, not too much, a couple of tablespoons of olive oil, um, and your lean, your lean protein in terms of fish. And it's been shown that this anti-inflammatory diet, we know, helps your physical health, but also, as I've said, your mood as well. So there's just more and more evidence showing this. And what previously people found is that a junk food diet, so that's one high in fat and sugar, that's called a pro-inflammatory diet, and that actually pushes up your risk of depression by 40%. So we can see a Mediterranean diet as being anti-inflammatory, and the risk of depression is pushed down. You actually get good mental health, as opposed to a junk diet. So the other name for a junk diet is pro-inflammatory. And that's really what it's about. Our diets, how we're having antioxidants to fight this inflammation, because it's happening all the time, inflammation in our bodies. As we're sitting here, all our cells are undergoing lots of reactions and producing inflammation. So we need to combat that. Now, in times of stress, as Phil has already alluded to, so if you have acute stress, you produce the hormone adrenaline. So what that does, increases your heart rate, increases your blood pressure, and basically the stores in your liver, which store glucose, the glycogen, it breaks it down to glucose to give you energy. So you can understand when you're acutely stressed, you're actually working your cells harder. Okay? So that's more oxidative stress. So that's a time when actually you need more antioxidants, more of a good food. Now, we know that when you're undergoing chronic stress, so for example, instead of an, an argument with someone, which is acute stress in our modern world, you have a long, long stress, sort of uh, maybe an hour's conversation with a difficult client. That setting, you have a different hormone being produced. Instead of the adrenaline in the acute phase from your adrenal glands above your kidneys, you've got cortisol. And what cortisol does, it's trying to make your body break down anything it can find to give you glucose. So it will break down proteins to try and turn to like glucose. It's going to increase your appetite so you get glucose as much as possible to give you energy for this chronic stress. You don't know how long it's going to last for. Is it half an hour, an hour and a, hour and a half? And what happens is that when that stress goes, your body just clutches on to any of that free nutrients, that free glucose, and turns it into fat. So that's a real problem when you're undergoing chronic stress. And when we're undergoing chronic stress as well, we tend to reach out for unhealthy foods. So for example, if you have a donut full of this lovely sugar, what happens, it actually, actually exacerbates cortisol. So it's a vicious cycle. And what we found as well is that people who are in stressful situations, they revert back to their baseline habits. So in this particular study, it was a group of students, one group, they had healthy habits. So they liked to drink green tea. And another group, they had unhealthy habits. So they liked a lot of um, junk food and a lot of coffee. And they found that when they were stressed, when they were studying for the exams, the group who had drunk green tea, they reverted back to their baseline, so they drank more green tea. Whereas the group who drank um, the coffee and had lots of junk food, they ate more of that. So when you're stressed, you revert back to your baseline. So if you've got good baselines, that'd be good or better. So very quickly, vitamins and minerals. So these contain a lot of antioxidants. Now, this slide, I could actually not only take 50 minutes for this, I could actually take 50 minutes for each of these. So I'll just whiz through quickly. Vitamin B and C. So there have been a few studies done on Barocca. And that contains, people think it just contains vitamin B, but it contains vitamin B, C, and also magnesium and zinc. And there have been studies to show that those who are st um, stressed in the workplace, when they took Barocca with the vitamin B and C, 
their perceived levels of stress actually decreased and their depressive symptoms, so not clinical depression, which we diagnose as psychiatrists, psychologists, but depressive symptoms, so just feeling a bit low in mood for a few days, um, feeling a bit tired, that actually improved with Barocca. So in those people who are undergoing those times of stressful um, situations. The other thing to say as well, um, Helene's touched on vitamin D and there's evidence there growing that it's um, beneficial for your mood. And one thing I would say is as well, with our food, the Mediterranean diet, which contains a lot of anti-inflammatories, what's been proven is it's actually the whole foods that's important. So I would not recommend people to be going out buying single supplements um, unless it's for particular um, conditions they've had and they're being monitored. Vitamin B and C Barocca, I mean, even if you take 20 tablets a day, nobody, nobody should here be doing that. But the thing is, that's fine in a way because they're water soluble. So you just, you know, when you go to the toilet, you'll pee them out. Whereas your other vitamins, your A, D and E, they're fat soluble. So you concentrate that in your body stores. So that's why it's quite dangerous. The interesting thing, thing to say as well is in England with vitamin D, so during the sort of summer months, so March and October, we're getting enough, but actually Public Health England recognises that we are not getting enough when it's the winter, the winter months, in the summer months we're getting enough. So they're actually recommending everybody to have 10 micrograms a day. And I don't think people really know that, but it just shows how important vitamin D is. And the thing is to say that your public health is recommending us having vitamin D, that must be very important because public health never advises us unless they've got loads and loads of trials. So like with nutritional psychiatry, that one randomized controlled trial, public health, and that's an Australian study, they're not gonna recommend anything unless you've got lots and lots of trials. So you need maybe about 10, 11 good randomized controlled trials or more, and then they gather the data like in a systematic review or meta-analysis and say, okay, this is what you should be recommending for people. The other thing to say is the reason why these are called vitamins is because when they were originally found, they were seen to be vital amines and they dropped the E later on but they are vital because you only get them in your diet okay? and also supplements um, if you need, but you can't, your body can't make them. And to touch on the minerals as well, just the bottom two, magnesium and zinc, there's some evidence there that potentially they could help with depressive states, but that needs to be investigated a bit more. Another thing to say is people who've got high blood pressure, it's actually due to having too much salt in their body and that'd be related to something called sodium. So the antidote to that is potassium, and that's found in your fruit. Now, I've talked about vital amines, so vitamins are vital. Essential fats, so that's your omega-3s. So they are essential because you can't make it in your body. So you've got to have that from your food. And again, I would not say that people should go out and buy omega-3, 6, 9 supplements um, because it's about the balance between the omega-3 and omega-6s and 9s. But just to say they're essential, we get them in our oily fish and egg yolks. Now, moving quickly on, talking about the gut-brain axis. So we've known for a long time that the gut and brain communicate with each other. But it's only in the last two years that we've realised that there's a whole load of bacteria there that really help in modulating our nervous system as well as our immune system. And what we found as well, that these bacteria when they are modulating things like our neurotransmitters, so these are chemicals which allow our nerve cells to communicate, so things like your serotonin, sort of the happy chemical, and your dopamine, which is related to the reward circuitry in your brain, and things like melatonin, which is involved in sleep regulation, we found that the, these bacteria, these good bacteria in the gut, they produce these hormones, they regulate these hormones, and that's neurotransmitters, and that's really important um, piece of growing evidence there. We also know that they're involved in inflammation. So if you've got enough good bacteria working well, then actually it's going to be a bit more anti-inflammatory rather than inflammatory. So it actually has been shown recently that there's potential that if you're feeding your gut bacteria well, you might be preventing chronic heart disease. Even this week, um, the British Nutrition Foundation, they were looking, the professors were, were talking about their research saying that potentially the gut bacteria might be preventing heart disease and that could be an area that we could be looking into. So it's not just about your diet, um, looking at your diet with all the arteriosclerosis. Now, the other thing to say is that with your gut, you need to feed the gut cells there so that it can process all your nutrients. And the way to do that is that you feed it fiber. 
And if you feed it fiber, then your gut cells are happy and you process all your nutrients well, and then you can have better preventive health for your physical health and your mental health. So if I just say, what is fiber? Because we'll hear it, and some people don't know what that is, and they think maybe if I have more of that, that's very good for constipation. So fiber is roughage. And I put this, this slide here, there, this picture, because a lot of people think that bre bread is not very good. But actually, just a couple of slices of whole grain bread is good for you. It contains the fiber. Fiber is found in plant food. It's non-digestible plant food. So when you eat it, it goes through your small bowel. It's not digested. It goes to your large bowel. And that's what the healthy bacteria, they like to eat. Um, they like to process to give your gut cells um, um, more, more energy to proliferate. So you find fiber in roughage like this, your whole grains in that Mediterranean diet. And you find it in fruit and vegetables. And you find it in your nuts as well. So, it's a very quick um, tour of nutrition, but I, what I wanted to say is really that your cells, all our cells are producing lots of free radicals. They need to be anti, they need to have antioxidants really to neutralize those free radicals flying around your body, creating cell damage, creating inflammation and predisposing to all these chronic diseases, the heart disease, type, type 2 diabetes. And also we know that having a good anti-inflammatory Mediterranean diet will promote better well-being as well. So it's not good just for your physical health, but the evidence there for nutritional psychiatry, for your mental well-being as well. And the thing is, we all talk about balance, and that's true for everything, whether that's nutrition, sleep, or exercise. So even your Mediterranean diet, you can have too much of that. So olive oil, it's very good for you, but the raw olive oil, just a couple of tablespoons a day, that's what I would recommend, and that's what we would recommend, because you can have, you have, I've seen people with 10 tablespoonfuls of olive oil, and it becomes very calorific, and it negates the good effect of the olive oil, the omega-3s there, which are anti-inflammatory. So it's something we call portion distortion. And then putting your knowledge into practice. So it's just being aware, not necessarily to change today, just looking at your plate of food next time you have lunch and think, actually, okay, that's quite a lot of white rice there. Do I need that much? Or maybe can I change white to brown? Why would that be? Maybe because I get more of my fiber that will help my healthy gut, which potentially would help my physical health and my mental health. And maybe actually I will just do this week, all I would do is a small change. Instead of maybe making everything that I have, the refined carbs, the white bread, um, all those things, instead of making more brown, maybe I'll just stick to just having maybe to pasta. I'll change that to brown. Everything else I'll stick to white. And once you've made that change for the first week, you can build on that. You can build on that momentum. And that's the problem with changing your diet. People think, okay, like someone else referred to earlier, or earlier on, I can change everything this week. And if I haven't done that, then I failed. But it's like very, very tiny choices. So tiny that you hardly notice it. So it becomes effortless. And once you've done one thing, you can build on that. And the other thing to say as well, very quickly, about that nutritional psychiatry area, which the Australian group are really at the forefront of, is that the reason why they found people, the 32.3% of people who improved and went into remission of their depression, was not only because of their diet, it's because they were also doing things like going shopping, they were cooking, they were having structured meal times, and food is supposed to be enjoyed with other people. And I think that's what I would like to say as well, nutrition, food and drink combined, looking for a healthy diet, and it's not boring having a healthy diet, when your palate is changed to nice, healthy, clean food, you really look for these good foods and it becomes more enjoyable. And to share your knowledge and share food with other people, just in general, that's what makes people physically and better in their mental well-being. That's what I have to say.